Right. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? All right, can you hear me on the left? Can you hear me on the right? Hey, uh, I want to welcome you all to the Warriors Corner, and I, I want to thank uh, AUSA for the opportunity here. Uh, my name is Major, Major General Pete Gallagher. I'm the director of the ne Network Cross-Functional Team, and uh, uh, based out of Aberdeen Proving Ground. It's a great place up in Northern Maryland, and we're also joined here by the Senior Mission Commander of Aberdeen Proving Ground, Randy Taylor. Randy, it's good to have you here. A lot of familiar faces here today, and it kind of reminds me, uh, you know, as, as we go through these things, you know, uh, one of the core commanders once said we were downrange, and a lot you see a lot of the same faces when, when you go down to places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the core commanders said, you know, sometimes it's like you're with the same drunks in a, in a different bar, or the same clowns in a different car. And so as I look out here and I see some, of, I'm not saying you're a drunk or a, or, a, or a clown, but it's good to see some of the same old familiar faces and a lot of new faces here today. And uh, you know, Dave and I were up here last year and uh, we were at AUSA in the fall. And I will tell you, we've been on a, a, a very aggressive path to modernize the Army network. And, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave here uh, real quickly to introduce himself uh, before we show you a quick video and then we'll kind of get into the discussion. All right. Uh, I'm Major General Dave Bassett, and I'm the Army's Program Executive Officer for Command and Control Communications Sorry. Tactical. Uh, there at APG with, uh, with Pete Gallagher and the team. Uh, you know, over the course of the last year, really 14 months now, uh, Pete and I, along with a number of other stakeholders from across the Mission Command Center of Excellence, the Cyber Command Center of Excellence, our partners in AMC, our partners in TRADOC, uh, this has been about getting us on a path to give us the network we need to fight and win in 2028. Now, I haven't well if I've seen the video, so I'm going to be as surprised as you are. And so why don't we go ahead and roll that. I hope it's good. Better be good. The Army's network is a critical modernization priority. Current network modernization efforts are delivering mobile, expeditionary, secure, and easy-to-use capabilities. The integrated tactical network for ITN is leading the way through the ITN. The Army is integrating new commercial products to provide commanders multiple options for communication in contested and congested environments. ITN capability provides enhanced network availability down to the small unit dismounted leader and leverages soldier and leader feedback from experimentation and prototyping. This model of rapid adaptation and agile procurement will inform network design decisions and allows the Army to modernize and speed. The network cross-functional team with acquisition partners is on the continuous path to identify and accelerate delivery of tactical network improvements. Starting in 2021, the Army will field enhanced network capability sets on a two-year basis. The first ITN capability set will field to select infantry formations that year. This modernization approach allows the Army to keep up with the pace of technological change insert capabilities as they become available and deliver the network in 2028. All right, so where's Paul Maney? Paul, are you here? Paul's not here. Well, I, I do want to applaud Paul Maney and the Stratcom team. No, you did a good job on the video. Let's give Paul a hand. That's the first time we've actually seen it. And uh, I wasn't sure where that thing was going to go and what it would look like, but you actually did all right, and I appreciate it. <laughs> hey. So, so what we really want to talk about a little bit today is, is if you think about the theme of this conference, okay, readiness for multi-domain operations, and you think about the why that we are here, and you know when we started this journey on network modernization, uh, you know almost two years ago with General Milley, he wanted to lay out the, the, the first principles, okay. So what is the Army all about? It's about preparing for war, okay, readiness. It's about fighting and winning, okay? So if you think about readiness for multi-domain operations, uh, where we, what we're all about right here to deliver the network of 2028 is to uh, allow our soldiers and our warfighters to be able to move, shoot, communicate, protect, and sustain in any environment, anywhere in the world, against any adversary. And the peer adversaries, you've heard all the discussions if you've sat on any of the other panels today, the enemy definitely gets the vote, okay? And in this competition, this world, this changing world and the changing character of war, the network we have today is not going to work in that environment we anticipate facing in 2028. 
So the why is really all about readiness for multi-domain operations, the ability for our soldiers to fight and win. Okay, so if you look at that as the why, and then we've tried to figure out the what. What do we want to do in terms of network design? And you know, with the CFT, the cross-functional team, trying to determine where are the adversaries going? What, is it, what are the threats that we are facing? Where is technology, how is technology emerging? And then working with General Bassett and his acquisition authorities on kind of delivering the how and helping us kind of figure it out. How do we align the resources? How do we prior reprioritize? You know, Pat O'Neill is here. The science and technology efforts. Where is industry going with research and development? And we ensure that every precious dollar is pointed in the right direction and we get the best capability as quickly as we can in the hands of our soldiers, okay? So in the video, you kind of saw a game plan on how we intend to do that. And uh, you know, I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the why and, and briefly get into the what, but right now I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. He's gonna kind of show you the how. All right, can we go to the next slide, please? I, I didn't know how much I loved our strategy until it had a soundtrack, that was great. <laughs> Um, so, so as Pete said, you know, we've had a partnership here between the cross-functional team that really drives the what of the Army network and the PEO and the acquisition professionals who bring the how. And so that partnership, I think, is, is evident when you see that we speak with one voice about how we're going to approach this. And so what you see on this chart is about four lines of effort. Unified transport, common operating environment, interoperability, and mobile command posts, kind of depicted on the right-hand side, and the objectives that we have by 2028. Uh, knowing that, that uh, we're not gonna deliver this all at once. And so we started out with a halt, fix, pivot strategy. Halting programs that we're not gonna deliver the objective capability, fixing the programs that we could to make them relevant to our end state, and pivoting to a new approach, both from an acquisition process standpoint, as well as technologies that we previously had not capitalized on. And so, halt, fix, pivot just didn't go far enough. And so, knowing that we didn't know exactly what we wanted in the end, technology is gonna change between now and 2028. We established a series of four capability sets starting in 2021. Now, some of you may say, why isn't there a capability set 20? Why are you waiting until 21? We're not waiting for anything. And in fact, when we look at these capability sets, we're not saying we won't field any capability in between those two-year windows. But we do recognize that that gives us some inflection points so that we can say, if it's ready by 21, can we buy it in 19 and experiment with it? Can we buy it in bulk in 20? Can we test it in 20? Can we field it as an integrated capability set in 21? And General Gallery will talk to you a little bit about these overlapping states when you're gonna field more than one capability set at a time. The old approach to acquisition was to treat an acquisition program a little bit like you were conducting a deliberate defense. You would have to plan everything out exhaustively. You'd spend a couple of years getting the requirement right, and then you would generate a program which was designed never to fail, and in doing so, especially in the IT space, you may very well design a program which by the time you field the capability, the technologies you're fielding are obsolete because you've taken too long with the process. And so what we've shifted was from that notion almost of a deliberate defense to more of a movement to contact. We don't know exactly what the end state looks like, but we know the direction of the enemy. And so we're gonna move forward with successive end states, building on success every two years across that, across those four lines of effort. And if you have a technology that you think is relevant, we need to know when it's relevant. And if it's not ready by 21, that's fine. We're gonna feel the network of 21 and we're gonna move on to the next capability set and we'll see you in 23 or maybe in between if your capabilities are ready. And so we laid out a series of objectives to kind of describe these capability sets. Some of you may look at the objectives and say, you know, you look at the bullet and you say, does this mean that you're gonna wait until 25 for cloud capability, right? That's the first sub bullet. That is absolutely not what it means. What it means, though, is that when we think about the themes of technologies that may be available in those time frames, that may be the first opportunity to bring that capability in in depth. We don't want to wait until 25 for, auto, uh, for artificial intelligence and machine learning. If we can apply those technologies to the network of 23 or 21, we're looking for those opportunities. But we do believe that by the time we get to those capability sets, we'll have the capacity we'll need, we'll have the resilience that we need, we'll have expeditionary capabilities, and we can focus on 
those additional capabilities of automated and protected by 25. So, so this framework, if you will, is what we've communicated to senior leaders, we've communicated it, uh, we put resources against it, and that this has now become kind of the touchstones that will allow us to evaluate and integrate capability over time. It provides the on-ramps and off-ramps for your technology, so that we're not saying we've got a program of record, we're gonna buy something over 20 years, and the ship has sailed. The next on-ramp is always less than two years away. Turn it over to you, Pete. Yeah, so before we go to the next slide, the point that uh, General Bassett brought up here, okay, if you kind of go 21, okay, what are, what are we gonna do? It's, uh, I mean, you know, we can't solve the entire problem, so expeditionary and, and intuitive is really, it's that immediate capability gap that we can close right away. We know that there's capability out there right here, right now, that's gonna simplify the network for our lowest tactical echelon, and it's gonna allow our expeditionary signal battalions to be much more expeditionary than they are right now. So we are driving towards that immediately, quick wins, get some points on the board, and get some solutions, okay? As we roll in to Cape Set 23, uh, we expect that industry is investing heavily in mid-Earth orbit satellite constellations, low-Earth orbit satellite constellations. There's significant progress in you know, capacity and bandwidth, uh, there's significant progress going on in cybersecurity and network security and protected SATCOM, where we will have a, we'll see a significant increase in, in network capacity and also the resiliency of our backbone infrastructure. By 25, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, some of the stuff that we're just really kind of getting evolving ourselves in today. You know, by then there may be an opportunity for what you know some are calling a self-forming kill chain, sensor to shooter. Okay a self-healing network, automated you know, pace and things like that, primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency, where the network takes the burden off the signal soldier and off that, that soldier in the fight and simplifies it. You know, we're not there yet. We're investing in it now. The S&T community's looking at it now. But by 25, it may fit into place. By 27, okay, we have to deliver a network that allows the Army to be multi-domain dominant. Okay, this is all kind of driven, not just Bassett and Gallagher's good ideas. Okay, these are mandates from a guy named Millie, a guy named Esper, that are saying we need to be multi-domain dominant by 2028. That's the Army strategy, which is nested with the National Defense Strategy. Okay, so we are currently at what we call National Defense Strategy Readiness Level 1.0. Close immediate capability gaps. By about 23, okay, 22, we cross this threshold, this phase line readiness in the Army strategy. And by 23 to 25, we have to start developing and, and achieving overmatch of peer adversaries. And by 27, we have to really strengthen our overmatch to get us to that multi-domain kind of dominance, okay? So if you look at our four lines of effort, assured network transport in a contested environment against a peer adversary. That's a lot of words. But what it really means is our network works no matter who we're, who we're gonna face it also means we're gonna dominate in a cyber and electromagnetic activity environment. Okay, counter EW, counter cyber, our network works, it's self-healing and it actually works its way through that. In terms of line of effort two, the common operating environment, our decision makers have to make decisions at speed. Okay, observe, orient, decide and act. The network's gotta help enable that. The applications we field, the network we deliver, it has to enhance decision making from that soldier on point to that you know, core commander, that combined joint task force commander in a full spectrum combat environment. Simplified decision making. In terms of uh, line of effort, the, the fourth line of effort, right now our, mo our command posts are, are, there's too much infrastructure. We've got tonnage, we have, you know, we rely on buildings, a lot of, you know, in, in, uh, in the tactical space, in many cases, we find ourselves in a sanctuary, okay? We're operating from forward operating bases and combat outposts. And we believe in the fight we'll face in 2028, we're gonna be moving all the time. We have to have distributed mission command in a very mobile, very lethal fight against an adversary that's, that's very mobile and very lethal as well. And so it's all about um, mobility and survivability of our command post. The line of effort that doesn't have a lot of programmatics aligned with it, but is absolutely critical in everything we do is joint interoperability and coalition accessibility in everything we do. We gotta be able to fight as a coalition we got to be able to fight with unified action partners in any environment. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So, so, 
so we should look at these set of activities. What I hope you take away from this, and I don't want to brief you every bullet on this chart, but what I do want you to recognize is we have a set of new technologies that we're tracking. We don't think we have all of them, it's not exhaustive, but we recognize that it's going to build on each other over time. Transitions out of the S&T community, as well as technologies uh, that are in development in industry. And in order to be able to put out a capability set, it's not something that we're just going to kind of throw out there. We want it to be integrated, we want it to be tested, and so we've laid out a series of activities, right? This is driven by activities and not acquisition process. We have to have the investment in science and technology that becomes the feed corn of tomorrow's capabilities. We have to be able to do experimentation, testing, right? And then buy things in one year so that we can do production in the next and field them in the following year. And when you lay this out over time, we got to be really busy. We've got to be doing multiple capability sets at the same time. I'll just kind of highlight in, in say, 21, we're going to be fielding Cape Set 21 while we're beginning the testing of the integrated capability set 23, uh, while we're starting the S&T investments and, and early experimentation on capability set 25. All right, so, so when we talked about kind of what is the, what's the battle rhythm and how often you want to put out a fully integrated capability set. We thought, you know, one year, way too fast. We'd be chasing our tails. Two years, probably about right. Three years, maybe not fast enough to capitalize on available technologies. Uh, can we go to the next chart? Right, so we talked a little bit about the why. We talked about the how, kind of the processes we're going to try to follow and, and, and how we're kind of pivoting to new processes as a team here. Uh, Cape Set 21, what are we looking at right here, right now, that's going to be delivered to our soldiers by 21, okay? Uh, some of the stuff, we call it the Integrated Tactical Network, or ITN, and the focus is on the brigade combat teams. Uh, we are we're providing, we're providing advanced networking waveforms. We're, we're leveraging commercial waveforms for a mobile ad hoc network in our lowest tactical echelons that we have not used before. They're scaling bigger and broader, and they're simpler to manage. Uh, we've got multiple radio vendors helping us with the solutions to deliver the best possible capabilities. We've got commercial industry, you know, various vendors working well together to help do what's best for our soldiers. And that is the key, is making sure that, you know, key stakeholders working together to help deliver the goods on behalf of our soldiers. We've also, we're leveraging things at the lowest tactical echelon with our, you know, the soldier on point with his net warrior device and his tactical assault kit has the ability to have the common look and feel and decision-making tools that you would have in a mounted platform and in our command post environment. So we're improving the decision-making tools. We're leveraging commercial gateways, radio gateways. Uh, we've made a conscious decision at the lowest tactical echelon to operate in what we call a secure but unclassified environment. And by secure, I mean the network itself is secure. We've got uh, NSA-approved encryption that allows the network to be secure. But we are operating, we made a, a conscious decision for the cla uh, security classification to operate unclass because we are operating with unified action partners. As the lowest tactical echelon, you cannot confirm the security clearance of your counterparts. If you're fighting with a Polish platoon in, in a Russian scenario or pick another scenario where you can't confirm, but you know you have to connect, we have to be able to ensure that perishable data it's going to help decision makers on point make those decisions rapidly as they we're able to share that. Integrated tactical network gets after that. And so we're focused on our brigade combat teams, our war fighting formations, but we're also focused on our expeditionary signal battalion. So some of the capability, uh, leveraging what the joint and special operations community are doing today, uh, joint communications support element down at uh, McDill Air Force Base, the 112 signal battalion out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, the Joint Communications Unit out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. <laughs> They're working very closely with General Bassett and his team, with Forcecom, the 35th Signal Brigade, and with the Cyber Center of Excellence, General Morrison. And we're running this Expeditionary si Signal Brigade Battalion pilot right now that's delivering a capability today that allows us to put more nodes on the battlefield. It requires less aircraft to deploy and fewer soldiers to install, operate, and maintain the systems and it allows us to realign force structure to attack some of the other capability gaps across the Army. So we're already making headway with uh, Cape Set 21. So, so, so you know, we talk about doing acquisition differently, and, and somebody, some may tell you, right, that, that the key to all of this is 
mid-tier acquisition authorities. Maybe the key to all of this is other transaction agreements. How are we doing? Uh, and that there's some magic bullet that's right. going to make acquisition go faster. Right? The Expeditionary Signal Battalion pilot that uh, Joe Gallagher just talked about was conceived around this time last year, fielded by the end of the summer, and tested in the fall. Okay? We did that under existing program authorities. So when I think about how we're going to do acquisition differently, my answer to you on acquisition strategies is we're going to have to do all of the above. Some things will be engineering changes to programs that are already in place. In some places, we're going to leverage mid-tier acquisition authorities. In other cases, we're going to leverage existing programs of record. And so as you look at all the kit that's on this, this page, it's a mix of all of those things. And it's going to take experienced acquisition professionals working alongside the CFD to identify the right kinds of authorities that we can leverage so that we'll be able to bend the acquisition system to the will of our leaders who want to go a whole lot faster than we have in the past. But if I were to do this the old way and try to write a requirement for all of this, I'd be waiting for years, I'd get it wrong, I'd spend the next two years competing the contract, and I would field yesterday's technology tomorrow. And so this is about being able to use existing technology, existing authorities, new acquisition authorities, different ways of contracting, blanket purchase agreements where I can already get access to a lot of these things, and trying to find creative ways, working together as a team to go faster. There's a lot of stuff on this chart, and we want to make sure that we can buy it all together, integrate it all together, and then provide it in a way that our soldiers can operate it together on the battlefield and sustain it. And so working together with our partners in SECOM, working together with our partners in TRADOC, we got to be able to train this, we got to be able to field this. We're not skipping past those steps as part of putting all this together. And so the key, the key is here by 21 to field this as an integrated CAPE set while we're already looking to the future about what we can do in 23. So when uh, General Bass and I went down to Fort Bragg Thanks, a couple of months ago, okay, we went down to, and we visited the 82nd Airborne Division going through their warfighter exercise. So General Mingus and the division was going through a major combat training center rotation for their division headquarters and their decision making. Uh, they were exper experimenting with new mobile command posts and they were also experimenting with the command post computing environment. We also had an opportunity to go visit the Expeditionary Signal Battalion, 50th Signal. Uh, while we were there, they had just, as General Bassett said, they had just filled the equipment a few months ago. Uh, soldiers had just returned from Syria with that new, operating on that new equipment. We were on a v meeting with the battalion. We got to meet the soldiers that just returned from Syria. We're on a VTC with a team from that same battalion that was employing that equipment in Israel, okay? So if you just think about it, it was the approval from General Milley this time last year and the speed with which we were able to get that equipment, get it in the hands of soldiers, get it out there, and get some feedback from real operational exercises and real operational deployments is, is it's really, it's amazing, okay? And, and there, what I will tell you is we are moving fast, and not everything is perfect. We are making, you know, we, we, you know, we were given the mantra when the CFT stood up, fail fast, fail cheap, you know, but don't fail all the time, okay? I will tell you, uh, you know, we've made some mistakes, we're moving fast, and we're, we are, we got both feet on the gas, and we're knocking down some cones, okay? We're, we're running through, there's pedestrians in the way, and they better watch out, right? But, but I will tell you, uh, we're finding, you know, we're finding what we're delivering is capability that our soldiers like. The soldiers love this stuff, and they want more of it, and we've got to move faster, okay? One of the things we recognize is that even though we're going quick, and even though this, this equipment isn't perfect, it's better than if we feel to the old stuff. Yeah. Right? And we recognize that, the choices that we're making. Command post computing environment is a great example of this. We had kind of kept that in the lab for years, and last spring we made the decision to get it in the hands of soldiers, and, and, and begin to get more active feedback from units employing it in warfighter activities and others. And so we did that, right? We accelerated learning. And so last fall, when we took it to NIE, we'd already learned an awful lot. And so we have some test results from NIE. They're not perfect, right? But, but we didn't wait for the test results to start fixing all of it. So when the test results come out, they're already reporting on a version of software that's like six months old, right? And we've already moved past it to try to fix those things, get at the underlying issues, and feel better capability significantly faster than we have in the past. This process doesn't always start with a perfect requirement. It starts with the right question. What could we do? How can we leverage commercial technology? How can we bring those things together to deliver better capability to our soldiers? 
if we don't do it, what are they going to have instead? And then make a risk-informed decision about what it's going to take to put this out there. And so, you know, we talked about secure but unclassified. You know, I, I have cracked the code on the perfectly secure network. We know what it is. You just turn it all off, right? But if you want to talk, if you want to enable communications, you're going to have something less than a perfectly secure network, and, and you're going to secure it as best you can and balance usability. And so we know that to be able to communicate, meeting at a common level of classification that both sides are, can communicate on is absolutely key. And so this notion of where are the security boundaries at the tactical level? Is it possible that tactical communications are really controlled, unclassified information? That, that the Blue Force picture, which is going to be irrelevant in a few hours, doesn't have to be classified secret? Can, in doing so, can we enable interactions with our coalition partners? Because when we go fight as a coalition, one of the first things we do is stand up a coalition network. Usually it's a secret releasable network, releasable to our coalition partners. What if that were our primary war fighting network? What are those things that truly have to be U.S. secret that have to be on the other side of that cross-domain guard? And so we're exploring those things together. Because if we don't do that, and we need to bring a coalition capability, it's just another stack of equipment. It's more servers, it's more backbone, it's more bandwidth, and we're trying to balance those things together. And so that when we look at what's part of the current ITN construct, when I say integrated tactical network, think about the integrated network that I'm giving to a BCT. It is programs of record. It is COTS capability. It is mid-tier acquisition. It's all of the above, delivering that integrated capability. Uh, and so we've given you a sense of what some of those things are. As we work through this as a team, a lot of what we've been trying to now understand is take it to the next level. What do all these things cost? And how are we balancing affordability of our ITN as we go forward so that we know what are the cost drivers? Some of the things on the bottom here, they don't cost very much at all. A few of those things are expensive. And so as we understand that what is expensive and what's not, can we have a cost-informed integrated capability set that we can feel across our army and sustain it. So if you think about readiness for multi-domain operations, we started with the why, we're going to finish with the why. This is about enabling our soldiers to fight and win in a contested environment against a peer adversary. And the charter we've been given and the mandate we've been given is let's deliver this network by 2028. We know we can't do it all at once. You know, the network ex expands to everything the Army's doing. It's really ubiquitous. Everybody everywhere has network challenges. We're trying to focus our efforts to deliver over time the best possible capabilities for our soldiers. I want to thank all of you here today for joining us for this, uh, this Warriors panel. Uh, thank you in advance for the capabilities you will deliver in the future. Uh, we need you on that wall. We want you on that wall. Uh, but as the vice says, not everybody gets a trophy, okay? And if it doesn't fit in our network design, don't go away mad, okay? Uh, if it doesn't fit in 21, what you have may be ready by 23 or 25. Feel but I uh, thank you all very much. Yeah, feel free to tell our senior leaders, we think this is a Cape Set 23 thing. Yeah. We think this is a Cape Set 25 thing. Use that vernacular. Because a lot of times when you talk to them, and I'm talking to you, industry, damn right I am, okay, they think it's ready tomorrow, right? They think it's already part of Cape Set 21. And if it's not, we need you to be honest about that so we can get it in the right place and plan on its integration and give us the right set of design choices to transform our network, okay? And so we need your help in that regard. God bless you. Thanks for what you all do. Thank you very much. Army strong. Are we taking questions? I don't know. Q&A? <laughs> All right. We have time for no more questions. Thank you. Are, are we out of time? I don't know. Are we out of time? Are we good on time? No time. All right. We have one question. Sorry. I'm, I, you, you were Trump. Is planned obsolescence part of this? Is planned obsolescence part of it? I don't think planned obsolescence is part of it. Uh, the reality of obsolescence is facing us today. You, you know, General... Taylor has a responsibility, responsibility of sustaining everything that's in the tactical force. And obsolescent parts are a reality today. So where we're trying to go is divestiture where it makes sense, when it makes sense. And some things will be wholesale replaced rather than, uh, you, does, that, does that answer your question? So okay. I will say that our, our plan acknowledges that that exists. And so one of the things that we've been working with CECOM on is, to, is going in on these new capabilities 
Uh, I've committed to General Taylor that our base plan right now is to buy enough warranty coverage to allow a disciplined decision on transitioning things into sustainment that we know we need to sustain beyond a seven year period. And so we're going to work together to make sure that this is sustainable as well. I'll cover that tomorrow, Warriors. Thank you all very much. Major General Randy Taylor, the Senior Mission Commander and Commander of Communication Electronics Command, will cover that during his Warrior Corner tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Army Strong. Oh, forge the future.